Welcome everyone to another webinar of Rancor, this time about developing secure and performant JavaScript for SharePoint with Hugh Wood. Hugh, can you please? Yeah. So the, how this uh, webinar works, um, we have uh, a tool called Zoom and you can ask questions during the presentation and we'll have a Q&A section at the very end where we will just pick up the questions from the Q&A functionality and ask, answer them live as much time as we have available. One of the most common sessions is uh, questions is, is this webinar recorded? Yes, it will be recorded and it will be shared with you afterwards. So don't worry if you have to leave earlier or um, if you want to share it with your colleagues, um, you will get a link to the recording at uh, probably tonight or tomorrow. All right, so um, welcome, Hugh. Um, please introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm, of course, Hugh Wood. I'm the lead developer at Rencor, uh, which means I work mainly on a lot of the performance issues, uh, some more of the more uh, complex rules that we have in the engine. And um, I also go around speaking a lot about JavaScript and answering a, a lot of questions that I get via email. Uh, so this presentation is based on those questions. Uh, my experience and background is I have two degrees, one in computer science and one in games programming. So when it comes to performance, I am, uh, I'm quite well versed uh, when it comes to security. I've learned a lot, especially over the, uh, the last four years that I've been with Rancor. So I'm gonna spread this uh, knowledge with you guys. I'm gonna start with some performance. JavaScript performance, is basically three areas. You've got loop performance, you've got memory reference performance, and you've got DOM performance. Getting a good balance of these things as you need them uh, when and where uh, you have them in the code, if you need to optimize them. Um, of course, don't pre-optimize, um, only optimize as required. That's the first rule of performance. But these are the three key areas that you need to look at if you do need to make these optimizations in your code. So I'm going to just jump straight in with a little bit of a demo um, so you can get um, used to the site I use. It's called jsperf.com. So we're going to jump into um, hopefully jump into a browser without PowerPoint crashing. That's a good start. So let me just relaunch PowerPoint. Copy the link. So Today's news in the UK as we uh, load this site up. Now I'm going to use Edge first, um, but I'm also going to get the page loaded in Chrome. So the first question that we asked was, which browser do you think is the fastest for, um, for running JavaScript? Um, it totally depends on the piece of code and what they've optimized. Okay, so sometimes Edge can be faster than Chrome. Sometimes Chrome can be faster than Edge. Uh, in a lot of cases, it, Chrome can be a lot faster than all of other browsers by a significant margin, up to two, three times the case in uh, some pieces of code. Now, JSPerf is taking a few seconds to load. So just while they load, I'm going to um, just go over the... Uh, the actual results, but we're going to have a play with them as well. Um, in JavaScript, we now have some low level functions for playing around with arrays and loops. One of the things that we can look at is pop and shift. These are very, very low level and they work with the array in a very low level type of code and um, actually direct into assembly. And um, JavaScript now compiles right down for the most part. Only very small parts are actually still run in a virtualization um, area. 
So we can see that a for in loop, which iterates through the object and uses object references, is many, 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 many times slower than using a while loop with a low level uh, function for access in an array like pop, for example. Um, we can see this test that I ran on a um, dual core laptop. Um, we, have, we were able to do 51 million operations by using a while loop and pop with an array, but only 12,000 while accessing the exact same array, but with a four in loop. So using the right type of loop and the right type of access for uh, the data object that you require makes a massive impact on performance and security, but we'll come across that afterwards. Now these browsers should be loaded. Please tell me JSPerf isn't suddenly down. Okay, I'm gonna continue on just a little bit. I'll explain some reference performance while they load. So, ah, there we go, it's just loaded. No, it's not. No. So we'll come across that again in a second. So object references in JavaScript. Um, it's very common to have, especially in SharePoint, deeply nested object trees of data. Um, you can often reference these in this, this example, for example, is a.b and then have a number inside there, or a.b.c and have a number inside of there. Each one of these layers is a separate object. If we need to access that data in num, every time we say a.b.c.d.num um, requires an extra step as the browser has to go into object A, then it goes to the reference to B, then it goes to the reference to C, then it goes to the reference to D, and then it finds the number, and then it's able to return that. So as we can see that we um, get a performance decrease every time that we have any sort of nesting in there. So if you're accessing several thousand objects, list data, for example, and you need to aggregate that data and you've uh, returned that into a query, the simple thing that we can do is dereference the E object if it's deep, deeply nested, for example, in this bottom example, and increase the performance to the top example um, so that we aren't accessing that data every single time. Let me just check to see if these are loaded. Oh dear, JSPerf is down. Yeah. <laughs> no. Hugh, right, so. I, I've checked yeah. it all to my computer. Yeah, it's uh, definitely down on my end as well. So, Right, okay. So all the demos run on jsperf.com. I've included all the uh, links in the presentation. Um, it was up 10 minutes before we started, and unfortunately it looks like uh, the demo gods have not been kind today. So um, we'll explain with diagrams and do the best we can. So this is an example of um, object references. This is exactly what I was talking about before. If we need to get that number here, oops. if we need to get the number at the uh, on the right hand side, we have to go through A, B, C, D, E, and num. Num has a reference back to E, E has a reference back to D, etc. All of them have references to object, and num has a reference to number, which has a reference to object. If we need to access two string, for example, um, from num, then uh, it has to go through number then to object to access that function. So we have the same um, object reference issue or slow down as we do um, uh, with nested objects as we do when calling base functions inside an object. Unfortunately, we can't um, assign E to a variable and speed anything up when it comes to um, accessing these functions. But if we need to access E dot two string, it only has to go through object to get the, to get the value. If E is based off another 
um, object, if it has a different prototype, then you have to go through that prototype and then that prototype. And this is the problem that we get into when it comes to TypeScript. Now, TypeScript is um, a, a kind of shim or a, I'm not sure if you understand what the word shim is. Shim means to add functionality that doesn't actually already exist by writing code that gives the same approximate result. Okay, so TypeScript tries to give you everything in ES6 if you compile down to ES5. Is, um, e ES is the ECMA script version. E uh, ES6 is, uh, ES is the ECMA script version. So we have 5, which came out in 2010, ES6, which came out a couple of years ago, ES7, which is um, just about uh, stable. Uh, we're adding a few more functionality, ES8, which is already on the table. So TypeScript, as it goes forward, will continue to add that extra functionality in the new versions as they come along to give you access to it earlier. Now, the problem with that is sometimes it, becomes, uh, it comes with a performance decrease. And one of those things is when it comes to inheritance, especially the extends keyword. Now, if you don't have access to that functionality in your browser, the extends keyword um, heavily impacts performance. The reason for this is that extends goes through all of the properties and it changes the constructor, uh, constructors for those objects one after the other. So every time you create a new object, you have to go through all of the prototypes. Those prototypes have then got inheritance built on top of it. So often what you'll find is sometimes you can be going through five or six um, different objects to be able to get to the same data. So with TypeScript, what we want to avoid is this extends, uh, extends keyword or anything that does um, any sort of deep nesting. Um, if you really have to, if you want to have maintainability over performance first and then optimize afterwards, that's actually probably the best approach here. Keep the extends uh, in for any sort of inheritance that you want to write, um, and keep your code maintainable first. Okay. Now, this is where it gets a little bit confusing. Browsers behind the scenes don't implement the types you in the ways that you think they do. There's two types of structure that a browser will use to store data in JavaScript. One is a linked list, um, and the other is a hash table. So a linked list can be all over memory. The first object refers to the next object in the chain, and then that refers to the next object and the next object. So if we look in the first example, we can see that they are a direct chain. If we want to um, visit the uh, element two, we have to go through 0, 1, and then 2 to be able to get to it. In a hash table, we can say we want to and get the data. Now, you might think, well, we always want a hash table then. Well, the thing is with hash tables is they require um, allocation time. So here, for example, we have some memory. We've got the green blocks which represent um, our linked list. They can be anywhere in memory. Then we have our array in memory. Now what happens, this is where the hash table is stored. What happens when we need to add a new item? It has to reallocate the entire hash table. But in the meantime, the linked list has been able to allocate blocks more dynamically. Now these are the two structures that a browser will use and it'll choose which one to, uh, to use depending on how you've written your code. And most of the optimizations that you see in browsers are the decisions, decisions between using these two structures or even perhaps in the case of a normal number array, a direct array in memory. So um, 
Now, unfortunately, I was going to do a demo on this as well. Um, Matt, is it still down for you? One moment, checking. It seems to be something loaded, but um, extremely slow. Right. So I'm not sure. I, I have the page open now, but it's extremely slow, so I'm not sure what's going on there. You can give uh, it a and maybe it loads in the background. Yeah, we'll see. Let's have a go. Probably don't want to wait for it and just go on for now. Yeah, I was just seeing if it was going to load quickly. Uh, GSPerf has let me down, so we'll, um, we'll let you go through the uh, the links in the presentation yourself afterwards and have a play when it comes back up. So how do we get around not knowing how the browser is going to deal with our arrays? Um, we can trick the browser. Uh, so for example, if you want to create a large array um, of data, it might grow over time. Create the array in the largest size that is going to be required. Even create it twice as large as you think you might need it. This will completely prevent the browser um, creating the type that has to be reallocated or creating a type that is um, is linked in memory. It will um, allocate an entire block of memory in one go that you will need and you shouldn't need anymore. And that way you will avoid both situations of the two downsides of both types. And it's always the correct um, storage type. Um, objects uh, require, if you if I could have shown you the demo before, um, it would be a lot easier to explain, but um, objects require a lot more time to access the data than um, a properly uh, created array. Especially if you're using, uh, for example, a string reference. If you were just using a number reference in an object, it is almost as fast as an array. In fact, behind the scenes, the browser will optimize it into an array. But also on the same vein, an array is used for t uh, be is best used for types like numbers. Um, and one of the things that you can do is combine both objects. So, for example, if you have an object with uh, all the um, nested objects by uh, an integer value, you can use an array as a lookup value, um, so that you get in the be best benefit of both objects using the object as a hash table and the array as, um, as the hash lookup. And this allows you to be able to um, find where data is more uh, in sparse arrays uh, more easily. We did the same thing um, in C Sharp with hash tables and lists. We create a hash table and we're able to look through a sparse array more easily. Um, but as I said, don't worry too much about optimizing arrays. The only thing I would uh, say to optimize anything that you're doing with, uh, with the arrays themselves is by pre-allocating the data that you require. So DOM performance. Now this one is a lot more complicated. There's a lot more stuff to um, to understand here. The basics, uh, the basic uh, premise is you do not want the web uh, the web page to be redrawn by, uh, by the browser every time that you change something on the page. What you want it to do is you want it to act in an optimal manner. So every time you insert or remove an element, the um, to the document object model, uh, modify content on the page, the text in an input box, um, move DOM elements around the page, especially animation. Um, so that's CSS animation or JavaScript animation. To, if you take measurements of an element using some of the pre-built functions, um, changing the CS styles of an object, changing the class name of an element, which is very common in jQuery, for example. Um, just dynamically adding and removing style sheets, which is another trick to bulk change the way something looks um, on the fly. 
resize the window, automatically scroll the window. All these things require the entire page to be re redrawn by the browser. And what we want to do is we want to avoid that as much as possible. Now, we can take a couple of approaches. There are different types of framework. Things like handlebars will give you a template and give you the compiled output, and you can decide on how you want to deal with that yourself. React um, does all the updating and everything intelligently for you. React is probably the preferred method unless you need to uh, Re React's method is the preferred method if you really need to have something hitting the ground quickly. If you want to build something a lot more quickly and not have to worry about um, optimizing the performance and things, you want that out of the window, then there are frameworks out there such as React that will do that for you. If you require something that's extremely heavy, so for example, you're building a whole um, single page application and it's going to have lots of dashboards and things like that. React might end up being quite slow and you might make the, the decision early on to control those draws as you need them so you can decide when things are updated and how they're updated yourself to more optimize how the page is going to be drawn. So yes, Another demo that's not going to work, but threaded performance. Um, browsers and JavaScript now support multiple threads called web workers. They are significantly faster. If you need to use a web worker, they, there are sh um, shims and workarounds, so the older browsers can still use them. Um, I'm sure that some of you probably still have uh, customers on IE6 and IE7. Um, as much as you want them to get off those uh, versions. But I mean, this is, this is the reality of IT at the moment. So, but there are workarounds so that these will use them. They will use uh, the extra thread that's in JavaScript to simulate using a web worker. So if you have something that is data heavy, has a lot of processing, then especially if it can be broken up into chunks, and a web worker is the best case scenario for this. So for example, if you've got a grid on the page and you want to manipulate all the data in that grid um, without causing uh, a lot of slowdown in the browser and getting the error message that the page isn't responding, et cetera, then a web worker can be sent off to um, process the data and send back the result. So then it can be aggregated and displayed as you see fit. And um, this performance demo uh, shows the massive performance difference between each of the web workers uh, and how they perform against each other. Now, I'll see at the end if I can um, maybe get on JSPerf and show a couple of these demos because I know we're going to get through faster without showing them. Um, but we'll see what we can do at the end of the uh, the end of the webinar. So let's jump into security. There's a, the there's a lot less. Jace, uh, Perf seems to be better now, but um, I'm not sure if that's the case everywhere. It's kind of funny that a performance tool is so bad. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it's written by a single guy. Um, it's paid for by him. Uh, he's the only person who works on it. He's very private when it comes to working on it and he refuses help from a lot of people. However, it is the best place for testing performance of different cases of JavaScript. Yeah, nevertheless, but, pretty ironic, right? <laughs> yeah, it is extremely ironic. But it being so popular and him being the only person who um, funds it and works on it, it's... Um, I can see why it might go down. Just give it a try now. Just uh, have a look if the page loaded that you had before it might be. Yeah, let's have a go. Let's, let's look at the array JS perf here. Let's see. Uh, 
I'm getting a bad gateway on Chrome. In the meantime, I have a quick question by Jordi regarding DOM manipulation. Um, you yeah. mentioned React. Um, how does Angular JS and Angular two four fit into this picture, especially in a SharePoint environment? Um, now, as you may or may not be aware, there are things that use React in SharePoint um, already. So, adding more frameworks to the page and more times into the page will slow down uh, the page some, uh, somewhat. And JSPerf is down, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, but never mind. We'll get into that later. So it's. It just depends. This is this is more a supportability, maintainability issue um, when it comes to developing the applications. If it's what your team is used to using, then you can get the code out the door and support it much easier in a framework that you are used to using. And in most cases, that is more important than the small performance difference that you will get by using Angular on the page when React is already sat on the page, for example. Now, um, as we go into the new versions of 365, we know that we're going to be getting a brand new master page that is based on something early, the early version that we saw at some SharePoint Saturdays last year was using React on the master page to show all the different sections. Um, so going forward, I'm not sure if they'll change the mind. Microsoft do that quite often, um, but it's just something to be aware of. Most of the time that you can, you can save more time using something that you're familiar with and uh, support it better and have it running in a uh, much more performant way than if you're using something that you don't know. Um, but I would always learn the the framework that Microsoft recommend you to use uh, for that fact, in which case you're getting the best of both worlds. Okay. So information security. I'm just saying, uh, I, I guess you tried on the on your second screen. Um, on my end, at least, JSPerf is now working fine again, but um, I'm trying in Chrome. And I heard from others it's working in IE11 but I'm not sure if this is the yeah, case I... everywhere. <laughs> Sorry. Let's have, let's have a look at the um, pre-allocation demo, see if that's going to load. Oh, yes, it's loading. Yes, excellent. So let's look at the array pre-allocation so you can understand that. This is more, one of the more complex scenarios when it comes to arrays. Um, this kind of combines the first loop demo that I did plus the allocation so I can spin two into one and then um, save some time here. So there are different types of loop as you may or may not uh, be aware. Um, there are normal for loops, there are loops where we access the object in, inside every loop which is a performance uh, degradation issue um, and we are either pre-allocating an array completely here, for example, or we are growing an array up to its maximum size over and over. So let's run this in um, in Edge and see how this runs. So now how this performance uh, test works is it uses the browser compatibility tables to determine what browser that you have. So it's actually matches Edge at the moment to Chrome um, in, in its current state. Edge is no longer Edge according to this test. Uh, it's, as it's more akin to Chrome with what it, uh, the different types and JavaScript uh, functions that it supports. Now we're almost completed. Now this is quite a fast machine. I'm running at four gigahertz with eight cores. Um, and we can see here at the top, these ones here where we're growing the array are running around about 40% slower. The ones where we're, we make that uh, an even bigger problem, we're running almost 100% slower than 
uh, the, our best case scenarios. They are, it, the problem gets worse and worse. So we only managed 543 samples on an array that's 65,000 um, in size compared to 208,000 on an array that's 1,000. So as your arrays get larger, we can see that the problem of not pre-allocating your arrays becomes um, almost exponential. Um, we can see that if we just completely pre-allocate the array with a new array, we are hitting um, 359,000 samples per second, which is quite a lot faster, um, almost 50% faster than a regular um, thousand size array and here that we're using uh, again the thousand size away array now the if we um pre-allocate the 65,000 ones we can see that um we do have a problem but in this test actually i can see that we have um uh, this this should not be there like that so the guy this wasn't me who wrote this by the way um it's written by someone called Ilya Volkov. Um, we can see here that this result we should ignore because the code isn't the same. But we can look at, compare this result here to the top result, and we can see a 50% performance gain from pre-allocating the array. Let me just see if I can get the, um, the web worker demo up as well. almost nerve-wracking watching this load after it being down. All these demos and code samples are there for you to play with. And you can also log in with your GitHub credentials and create your own versions. So um, we're not getting a test button. There we are. So let's run some parallel processing tests using web workers and see exactly how quick they are. So we can see instantly two threads is almost twice as fast. Uh, well, I'd say more like 50% faster. Three samples this was, seems to be about the same as two in this case. We're speeding up a bit. So we can see here that um, we are getting a 70% performance increase up to four threads on this system just by using the web workers. And this also is non-blocking. So this can be run in the browser without blocking anything uh, of the main thread so that the page isn't sl uh, slowed down. Um, it just uses callbacks and then executes more JavaScript in the main thread as it's required. This can give the end user a much better performance, um, perceived uh, performance, as well as actual performance gain. So web workers is something that if you've got a lot of data to process and a lot of data to process at the same time, and you can do, uh, have to do the exact same process on many items, this is something that you want to be looking at. So let's go into information security. Now we've looked at a couple of the demos. The other demos are there for you to look at um, in your own time. So information security. Um, we know that by next year, we're going to have to have more strict rules about information security in Europe. Um, the basics is if a user says he wants all of his personal data to be gone, um, for whatever reason, uh, you need to have processes in place to deal with that. The other side of the coin is keeping that information safe um, from being stolen. Now, explain information uh, security a little bit. We have three separate areas. We have um, people, products, and procedures. So, um, the procedures that the organization have to follow, for example, if you're an ISO 9000 or 27000 uh, company, you have specific 
um, procedures that you have to follow in place. It might be 9001, um, 9002, et cetera, that you have to implement, but you have procedures that you have to implement. Um, in the financial sectors, there are other procedures that have to be followed. And if they're not followed, then that is a breach of that sector of security. The physical security, the products, the software, this is where we come in as developed developers we need to make sure that we aren't causing any holes in our software and then the people you know it's very easy for someone just to copy and paste um it's very easy for somebody just to give out information that they they shouldn't have or accidentally give someone their password or purposely give someone their password um and these effects um, different things. I mean, uh, we've got also inside the hardware, software, and communication, and then these uh, combine. So anything to do with software is about availability and integrity, and the communications is about confidentiality and integrity, and hardware is about confidential confidentiality and availability so everything works into the center to be able to get make sure that your information on your system is secure now we can bear that in mind when we apply it um, to uh, the code that we write now it is almost impossible to remember um, all of the web security procedures that you have to follow but there is an open source project um, called OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project. And there is a, for example, the cross-site scripting cheat sheet and various scanners for different software for, that you can write um, for these uh, extra security rules. And these can be also integrated uh, into the results with SBCAF um, that we give you the extra specific SharePoint ones. OWASP is just general web we give you the SharePoint security rules um, and uh, other um, security scanners that you may or may not use within your organization that you are required to use. All this data can be put together so that you can get a, a performant and secure picture of the system. Now the XSS cheat sheet, let me just um, come out to present a view and copy link. So I don't trust clicking that after it crashed last time. The copy link didn't work. Is this going to crash again if I click this? No, it's not. Okay. So now I would go through these with you, but as you can see here, there is a lot. I could do an entire session just on um, OWASP and what each of these different things mean. But as a web developer, understanding how all these attacks work and um, how that you can detect them in your JavaScript code and where you need to have a look in your JavaScript code to prevent against these things um, is quite important. And a lot of it is developer knowledge that you have to go through. Um, everything from using um, hexadecimal and octal values, if you need to use those uh, for anything. Um, image cross-site uh, cross scripting. A, an attack that was quite common before um, was to have data embedded inside the information attributes of an image. So when it was uploaded to SharePoint or whatever system it was, it was completely fine there. But when the user viewed the image in their browser, it automatically uh, bypassed the security of the browser and infected the local system. And it is quite scary that things like that are uh, it, it are able to be done. But it's also things that you need to take uh, take note of when securing your SharePoint platform. So, for example, a simple fix in SharePoint is just to resize all your, uh, put the, all your images through the resizer, and that scrubs all the data anyway. Or just make sure that the data is scrubbed. Make sure that you have your virus checkers on there. As the programmer, there's nothing that you can do about that. But there are a lot of things on here that you can do things about, uh, um, ensuring that you've got your image tags correct uh, if you're automatically generating them. Um, if you are following ECMA script, 
that you follow every single one of these rules, all 105 of them, on uh, specific event handlers and how to use them because they all have different um, issues that you have to uh, take into account. Now, of course, our WASP have scanners to tell you um, all these things, but understanding these things is actually paramount for a developer. So this takes me to system security. Uh, this is this was the the scariest thing in the new SharePoint development platform that um, in the last six months that I've been researching about. Um, for me, anyway. So the first thing I want to go into is CDNs. A lot of people are going to be using CDNs. Okay, especially to host JavaScript, uh, uh, JavaScript libraries such as jQuery, for example. Microsoft has specific guidance on CDNs. The basics of that is only host JavaScript on a CDN if you're going to be using a Kemi or Azure. Um, and then also set the security options that you require. So, for example, a Kemi allow you to have a private IP that is not internet facing that you can act, put your scripts on so that um, nobody can search or find these things by accident. You can do the same sort of security issue as, as security things with um, Microsoft Azure. Now you might go, CDNs, there's nothing here. But a CDN is, as I said on the slide, a direct trade-off to gain performance by losing security. Anything that goes out of your safe zone out externally is insecure, regardless of how you want to look at the situation. Now, I'm going to explain this so you actually understand why it's insecure. Now, we have something um, on a physical network called an edge server. An edge server can be your web front end. It can be the load balancer. It can be the firewall or anything. These are what the attacker uh, the attackers are going to want to compromise. Once they've compromised those, they can attack any data that comes in and out of those machines. The first thing that they will tend to do is try to do a um, a DDoS attack, a denial of service attack against the machine, so it starts to fail. As soon as it starts to fail some of those DDoS attacks will start to become exploit attacks. Um, now, a lot of edge servers, especially from comp uh, external companies, will have very, very robust DDoS uh, protection. So what, they, uh, so what the attackers will do is when they detect that uh, protection, they switch to a burst attack, which means that they're going to be hit by very large amounts of data in one go. Um, they can also do subtle attacks. So the data is extremely tiny and the edge server doesn't detect it. And then suddenly as they've got in these requests in, a, a, normal, the, a request that looks normal but is actually an exploit, they will hit it with a DDoS. The edge server will, be still, uh, will still contain that request. The DDoS, uh, the DDoS attack will um, start to cripple the server and the network. And the edge server um, will most likely, in some cases, um, run the exploit when it normally would be throwing it away. So there are a lot of ways of bypassing these edge servers. Um, once they are bypassed, um, what you can do is redirect requests, for example. So if you um, access the load balancer, and somebody's asked for jQuery from the jQuery website, you can serve your own version of jQuery. And then everyone who requests jQuery into your SharePoint farm is loading this hacked version of jQuery. And that hacked version of jQuery can do anything. It can give them system access into your SharePoint farm. It can give them uh, access to all the local machines. It can get them uh, access to all the data that's on your page, automatically upload data and list files and things. So if you think a CDN is worth it in performance, in SharePoint, it really is not, unless that CDN is located inside, as we see in this uh, picture, the, the private network. We don't want 
any of our SharePoint data to be touching anything on the external network. This is in, this is going to include pictures. This includes any re, uh, any sort of requests outside. If you need to be using those requests, then you need to be um, looking for direct links and secure links using HTTPS to private non-internet facing um, sites. Because if you if they if the attacker knows, hey, um, we've detected jQuery uh, here, we know what this is, we can do something about that. They've probably got an exploit already for, set up for that, um, as along with many other thousands of common exploits. But if you're using a nondescript link to something that doesn't uh, doesn't have any sort of data, it's completely encrypted with HTTPS, that sort of attack is a lot harder to produce. It's not impossible to produce, it's a lot harder. So if the data is really that secure and you need to keep it internally, keep everything internally, including the CDNs. You pro um, use um, network proxies if you're in a very large company or a very large building so that you're not having to um, send the data all the time from the, from the same servers. You can use much cheaper servers uh, to cache the data locally. And this is a far more secure way um, of achieving the same thing, but also um, massively speeding up uh, your um, uh, your SharePoint pages in the same way as you do with a CDM. Now, the same thing comes with packages. Um, if you've heard of it or not, Rimrefall was a um, NPM package that ran the command rm minus f, which basically removes everything. It just deletes absolutely everything. As soon as you install the package, it deletes absolutely everything under your node, uh, underneath the root through the node command. So if that's run on your root hard disk, for example, Remrefall just destroyed all of your data. That was one of the actual malicious packages that were uploaded to NPM, and it took uh, about three days to find. Now other things have been uploaded into there, like um, uh, photos embedded into the JavaScript. Um, Java's, uh, we've had NPM packages that um, push data up um, automatically to a third party site with um, various information grabbing techniques. So anything that you include, whether it be a CDN or a third party module or application, you are completely responsible for that data. And that's up to you. Um, that is up to, uh, up to you to maintain. Now, code defects. This is, okay, this is my quick, area. Uh, quick interruption, Hugh, I have a question. Um, yep. Pradeep oh. asks uh, if CDN usage is recommended for SharePoint online sites as well. And the reason why he's asking is to achieve performance uh, of SPO sites. Yeah, so here, Microsoft guidance, this link here, um, will give you the guidance that you require. They say strictly to use a Kami um, or um, as you're for hosting the CDN um, scripts, okay? But in the most case, if you are having then to secure the CDN script by checking the hash and things like that when it's downloaded, you are completely counteracting the performance gain that you required in the first place. Most of the time, um, as long as you've set the, um, the local cache for the file correctly, um, it's not going to be downloaded all the time. It's going to be downloaded once from the SharePoint farm. And that's more than acceptable for performance gains. You're not going to need to use the CDM. It, the, you, you're not building a website that people are going to be accessing for the first time all the time. You build, you're building a SharePoint site that people are going to be accessing over and over again. So the cached files are much more efficient than CDNs for the most case anyway. I hope that answers the question. Um, if not, just ask again. Cool. Right, code defects. So, um, quick follow up from Jan. Do you mean Akamai? Akamai. Yes. All right. However you want to pronounce it, A K M A M A I. 
it's in the um, it's in the Microsoft uh, recommendations for CDN usage anyway. So you can uh, see what to use and why they recommend to use that with 365. That link is specifically for 365, but it really does um, cover all versions of SharePoint anyway. So code defects. If you have any sort of defect in your code, then it's going to be a security concern, whether it is actually a security rule that is broken or whether it's a normal uh, just a regular um, performance role. So for example, as we saw before, we can cripple an edge server by um, creating extra strain on the server and making it execute things that it shouldn't be executing. The same thing can be done um, by exploiting code. You can exploit code by causing performance strain on the actual system. And this is why it's important to make sure that you have a proper ALM process in place that um, tracks the defects in your code um, and that you can make sure that they are fixed in a timely manner because of, of course a defect left can cause other defects down the road that you can't detect because they rely on that defect being in place. Um, basically if you create a bug and you create code that relies on that bug being in place then you've created two bugs. Another question for you, how about performance of SPFX web parts compared to normal content editor web parts? Um, so far, we've not seen much of a performance difference. Um, from a server standpoint, the SPFX is a lot lighter. So it totally depends on the systems that you're running on. If you're running on ancient old systems, then you might find the SPFX web parts to be a lot um, slower than the old style web parts um, because there is a lot more JavaScript, but on modern machines, you're not gonna see much. And as long as that you follow uh, the basic premises of optimization that we've gone through, I mean, the, uh, the ideas here are ideas to follow. I mean, I can't give you the code. This is the code that you are going to run from now to eternity. In six months, your browsers are gonna be different. And this is the same problem that you've got. Um, it, you've got to write the code for your target platform and this is where it comes into it um, end user satisfaction if your code is running slowly and it's not working on their target platform they're going to be very very upset with the with the end product that you've created it's speaking, going to become unusable and it's going to be uh, open to creating breaches and all of these three things cost money and a significant amount of money a data breach um, is up now by 23%. And the average cost of a data breach is 3.1 million pounds, which is what three point, oh, in today's uh, exchange rate, it's probably about 3 million euros. But um, it's, it's about 3.8 million euros, I think, roughly, um, which is significant. In 2010, there was 54 billion pounds worth of documents stored in SharePoint in the UK alone. And that was in 2010. And that's only increased by then. And we've not had an official figure from that value. So the amount of data and the value of data that is being stored in SharePoint is growing. And if those last few slides didn't scare you, um, when you go back through the uh, slide deck and you run through a bit, a few of the things, I'm sure that they will. So we've just hit enough time for questions. So I know we've had a couple of questions as we've got, uh, gone through. Do we have any others, Matt? Yeah, we have a couple of more. So uh, first question, how do you test JavaScript projects specifically in SharePoint? Performance, functional testing, browser comp compatibility, do you use any automation tool? Um, there are automation tools available, especially for node and testing, but they are not going to give you a very good overview of what's going to happen. Um, the only thing that you can actually do is open up, uh, open it up when it's deployed into SharePoint and check in the browser. 
So Chrome has a lot of built-in tools for checking performance that you can use for making sure that the, um, the page redraws are working as you intended. So you're not redrawing the page too often uh, to make sure that the page is loading in a performant manner and that the page is performing in a performant manner. So really when it comes to SharePoint and performance for JavaScript, you have to uh, run it in a similar system to wh where it's going to be run in the end place and run it as an integration test. All right, another question. What are your, your top three JavaScript frameworks tools for SharePoint development? Oh, um, I would go React, Handlebar, and JavaScript. Okay? okay. If you can't do it in React and Handlebars, um, then, you know, um, pure JavaScript is perfectly acceptable too. And on tools that help you during development, I know there are things like Chrome, there's a Chrome extension where you can meddle around with things on the site and modify property yeah. bags and things like that. Do you like those? Um, I do. They're very useful for debugging things. Um, I actually use uh, Firefox Developer Edition, uh, which has a lot of uh, cool built-in uh, features and tools for playing around with code. Edge has got a lot of new tools and is really catching up with Chrome um, with the built-in editing features. And it actually has those um, in-page editing features built in. So you can play around with things much more easily. So using various browsers um, to achieve what you want is uh, sometimes the best thing. And always have multiple browsers open so you can see how things are, uh, are kind of working um, in, different, in different ways to give you a better picture. But always make sure that you're testing in your target environment. All right, um, we have a couple of more. Um, one question, do you have any recommendation for performance testing for custom SharePoint app apps deployed on SharePoint Online? Ooh. Um, yeah, that, that's a tough one. I don't think there is anything built specifically for that. Um, as I, I think that's more of a, uh, for the quality assurance team to be testing, um, uh, doing some manual tests. I mean, you could run some PowerShell scripts um, to automate that. Um, but you're not going to get a very, a very accurate picture because everything runs in the browser, of course. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, you can, of course, check your, um, your CDN speeds uh, when you host them with the Kami and things, but they're always going to be the same. There's not a lot you can do about that. Um, okay. And so, Yeah. Um, a couple more. Do you have any advice to mitigate security risks that are inherent to a CN-oriented JS file delivery, like SPFX packaging patterns? Um, make sure you follow the basic guidelines of always being responsible for what you use. So, <laughs> but, I mean, that is, that is it. I mean, just um, it's your head on the block. If you include a package that's insecure, then it's it's on you, um, and always have a look what's been uh, installed. Um, you know, sometimes a package can reference another package, can reference another package, and you can end up with dozens of packages that you didn't know you were including. And when it comes to code security, they all need checking, and to make sure that, that not none of them are going to be compromised. And the same goes with any CDN that you want to link to. Uh, regarding SPFX, there's a question, okay, what's your experience and are there any alternative options for SharePoint Framework? Um, I know Waldeck is um, experimenting with other options and me, SPFX is still in its infancy and it's going to um, have a lot of updates over the next six months. So I would say run with it and play with it. Do as you're doing now for your current projects, um, but keep updated with that because I think as a platform, as it matures, it's going to, it's giving you those options that you can do things with. Um, for example, Stefan Bauer uses handlebars um, instead of React. Um, I've seen guys using Angular uh, instead of React and SPFX. All SPFX is really a delivery mechanism now, and that's going to mature. 
Um, a performance question. When I do performance tests on SPO, my site gets throttled. Any advice? What can you do? Um, follow the guidance for preventing throttling. Um, that's all you can do. I mean, as long as you have to, you have to follow that uh, that advice. Um, even if you, even if you perform assessing, I mean, if it was SPO, wasn't it? Yeah, it was SPO. Yeah. Is, is is that a, a knowledge base article or something like that on on MSDN or uh, um, throttling? Yeah, PMP um, Microsoft uh, Patterns and Practices project has a lot of guidance on throttling. They even implement the methods for you in JavaScript and uh, JavaScript, see some PowerShell, etc., so that you don't um, don't throttle your uh, your site. And JSPMP, you mean? Yeah, JSPMP, PowerShell PMP, and CSOM, depending on how you're doing your performance testing. All right, so. okay. Um, all right, coming more and more in. Uh, how secure is, Share, is, a Share, is the SharePoint online list? Is the data stored in encrypted form when uh, in the rest in Office 365? Um, all, all data stored in 365 is um, fully encrypted on disk. Um, way beyond the standards that are going to be required by European law next year. Um, now, as it comes to individual data as how that's stored, that's completely a architectural decision um, and whether it needs to be a uh, any sort of development practices involved in that. Um, so you, you're really looking at uh, the architects to making sure that the data is uh, stored in compliant ways that you have to follow whether you're in us or in the EU, uh, eu or the rest of the world mm -hmm. okay i have three more questions um which is the best way to customize the list forms in sharepoint we're getting new guidance for that it depends on whether you're talking about spo or whether you're talking about on-premises on what version of sharepoint um on the best way of doing it uh, for example, as we go through to the modern UI in uh, SPO that will come to 2016 eventually, that um, you, you're not going to be able to use JS Link, uh, for example, but they're going to replace that with a uh, something something akin to React, but we've not actually seen the full uh, implementation yet, only the preview that was shown last year. So at the moment, we're a little bit in the dark of what's happening. Um, only MVPs who go to the dev kitchens and things like that will actually be able to be uh, able to see that data or people who have seen that data aren't allowed to share that data until it's um, <clears throat> more robust. Um, but that's something to keep your eye on. They, for older versions, if you're developing for 2013 JS Link, if it's for 2010, then you can use a script block, um, for example, and a custom web part uh, to go along with that for displaying in the list view. But these things are not going to be compatible as we go forward into modern UI. So you will have a supportability issue um, coming up there. Um, thank you. So we have a couple of more questions that we will answer, but just uh, in between because some people are already leaving as we are now over time. Um, sure. Can, uh, first of all, one question, are the slides uh, going to be available for download? Yep, that's the case. So we'll post that in the on the page where you signed up. You will have the recording later on, and all the links will be also listed there. And then, second, um, before we continue answering question, if you can please move one slide further, um, we have the next webinar coming up next month month on July twentieth, which is also about security in Office 365, but more about managing security. So this is now available to register. If you just go to rancor.com slash media slash webinar, and there you should find um, the next upcoming Rancor webinar with Liam Cleary, uh, an MVP from the US who is pretty known in the security space for SharePoint and Office 365. So you definitely want to check that out. Um, so going back to the questions, more and more questions are coming in. So we'll answer a couple of more. I'm not sure, depending on how many are still coming on, I'm not sure how if we can answer all, but um, let's start with the first one. 
Um, can a SharePoint app project use Bower JS Lint with JS Lint and JS Hint? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's no real, uh, nothing really for us, uh, nothing really from stopping you. It's just um, one thing I would note that the standards used um, in SharePoint are going to be different to the standards that you get from um, JS and JS, uh, JS Lint. These are um, rules that are specifically designed to write your code like Crockford, not write your code like Microsoft. And you should be writing your code like Microsoft. Mm. Um, so for because of that, we have our own JavaScript um, linting rules in SBCAF uh, that are designed specifically for using um, with SharePoint because a lot of the JS and JS lint rules don't actually apply. Okay, thank you. Um, isn't Microsoft Forbes that now be used for customization? Um, okay, it's, I guess the question is, okay, it shouldn't be Microsoft Forms be used for customizations. Um, uh, well, that story, so. that story is disappearing. Um, and we're going to get a new one. Uh, there are alternate solutions on the market that will be kept supportable if you would prefer to go for those. Um, well, usually the, the reason for uh, customizing, especially with JavaScript, um, but in general, customizing SharePoint is, of course, that all the other options are too limited um, yeah. for your needs. So, um, of course, you can go to a certain extent, can customize with forms, with power apps, with, with flows and so on. Um, but at the end, if you... When yeah. you get around those limitations, you will customize the pages. And Microsoft is starting to embrace those customizations again. So, so yeah, we'll see what the story is as it yeah. gets it gets announced. So, yeah, we've got a lot of updates coming in the next year to yeah. 365. There's another question regarding forms, like what's the alternative for InfoPath forms for on-prem SharePoint? Well, it's a little bit off-topic for, for this webinar, but um, so far we don't know. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah, we don't know. That's why a lot of vendors are coming up with their own form solutions yeah. and doing quite well out of it. So yeah, there, there's a there's a, a form solution that is actually open source and free. It's called Serratus Forms by Mark Rackley um, that also works on prem. Um, maybe you want to check that out. Um, it's as I said, it's open source, it's free, and provides uh, quite a nice functionality so maybe that is fitting your need and ca as it's open source you can adjust it customize it to your needs as well um, let me see uh, it's straight as form s t r uh, s t r a t u s form f o r m he asked me to spell it out um, we can add that the link later on to Cool. With the follow up. Um, let me see. There are more and more questions coming in. Let's have one in between here. How do you cope with modern UI, UX shortcomings? Besides the fact that you can't do things you'd be doing in classic mode, in many cases, the UX seems slower than what it used to be in SharePoint Online. Um, as I said, the story's not finished. So, how we cope is we, at the moment, we pull our hair out. Um, there's not a lot else that we can do. We just have to roll with it. As it happens, with, I mean, as it's always happened with 365, um, we have to look at the the actual official guidance. Um, the PMP guidance is up to date uh, when it works with that, so that's a good place to follow. And um, the new docs site is uh, is all up on MSDN, so you can go through all the PM, PMP guidance through the documents now. Um, but we are getting more. Uh, more of a story when it comes to customization over the next year or two. Um, but it is a lot slower than most projects wish it could be at the moment. Uh, yeah, I wish I could say something else, but <laughs> that's, that's all we've got. It's the same thing. Just, you know, cross your fingers and um, hope it does what you want it to sooner than rather than later. Okay, we have three more and then we'll shut it down. Um, sorry guys, so um, first question, um, do we have any coded UI testing tools for SPO to automate testing? Um, 
No, uh, because of the security involved, most um, Code UI tools won't work properly um, that we've come across. There are, cus there are custom scripts in PowerShell for Code UI that you can modify using the PMP library, um, which is probably the direction that you would want to go down. Um, that's actually more of a question for Russell, actually, Matt, than, uh, than me. But um, he's a quite an, uh, one of our colleagues is quite an expert in coded in uh, coded UI. But yeah, as I said, most of the tools we've looked at won't work because of the security issues involved. Um, it was the same problem that we had when we had uh, Kerberos. Um, so we need to you need to get the the PowerShell versions and modify those uh, with the PMP PowerShell so that you can authorize. Uh, for the coded UI, and that would be more than sufficient for automated testing. Okay, um, let me see what else do we have. When I use this CDN for image library, the image which gets dynamically loaded from JavaScript does not work with the CDN. It works only for static HTML. Any idea? Um, no, it might be might be a, uh, a browser. A security issue. I would have to look at the code um, to see what exactly the issue is. Uh, I would probably have a look to see what the security browser options are. Try in a completely unsecure browser, see if it uh, if it works there or not. Um, All right. But yeah, that 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 would be my first inkling. What I would first look at. Okay, and now the final question. Um, which might be a redundant question. If we have a CSS file referred in SharePoint, not via a CDN, but directly, and the CSS has some fonts included which refer external URLs, what is the best practice here? Um, I would bring the fonts internally and change the CSS files to point towards them. Um, that, is, that would be the best way to make sure that no request is going outside of your safe zone. Yeah, the, um, the fonts are basically a, another resource, like an image that you refer from CSS. Yeah. So it's basically so not you can, Yeah, you can just download them, um, re put them onto, into your deployment package, and uh, change the URLs. All right, now we have a final one. Um, and I've got one more in from Darlene, so um, you're a lucky winner. Is there a way to get cross-domain data using JavaScript without requiring a use of app model add-in web, app web? Um, you need to use a uh, coded proxy. So on-premises, you can write your own um, a proxy site that's on the same domain as the, share, as the SharePoint that goes and fetches the JavaScript data for you. Um, or you have to use the... Uh, the the built-in functionality in SharePoint. There is no other way around it, um, because if you open that door, you open your uh, open your entire SharePoint farm to direct attacks. So you you have to use a local a proxy that's on the same domain as the SharePoint um, uh, site that you're on to be able to access that data. All right. That's it. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Hugh, for this interesting uh, presentation. Um, as said before, we have recorded this session, and we will also provide all the links mentioned in this uh, webinar so that you can rewatch it, share it with your colleagues, and uh, download the slides. Um, you will hear from us probably tomorrow in an email uh, as a follow-up where you can get all the links where to get this. Um, Hugh, thank you. Thank you uh, for letting me do this. and. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for requesting that I do this as well. So. Okay, and for everyone else, as mentioned before, um, Liam Cleary, uh, very interesting webinar coming up next year, uh, next month on 20th of July. So go to our website, slash media, slash webinar, and sign up for the next webinar also in the security space. And apart from that, I wish you a great rest of your day, and uh, see you soon at another webinar. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.